Hey everyone, you know the drill by now. Take your phone, throw it away, unless you're watching on a phone. Okay, let's get started on AP Environmental Science. To start off, I have a question for you. Would a developing country or a developed country have a greater energy consumption? Who would consume more energy? Developed or developing country? Three, two, one, answer. The answer is developed countries have the greatest energy consumption because we are the most industrialized. So the first trend for, for us to observe today is the more industrialized a place is, the higher the energy consumption. Now, another question for you. Would a developed or a developing country use more fossil fuels? Three, two, one. The answer is a developing country would use more fossil fuels. Why is this, you ask? Well, it's because in devel developed countries, like for example, the US, we can use more alternatives. We can afford to use them. However, in developing countries, they don't necessarily have the natural access to these, um, ch these alternatives that are better and energy efficient. And so they're forced to use fossil fuels. Now, the next question to answer is, what is the most commonly used energy consumption in most developing countries? The answer would be biomass and especially wood fuel. Wood is used as an energy source in many developing countries. That makes sense, right? Fire and many other things. Well, also think about this. What are the environmental concerns that come with using wood fuel? The answer is particle emissions will turn into smog. Fire equals smog. And again, that just causes air pollution and whatnot. On the note of air pollution, well, we have to talk about the second law of thermodynamics. What is the second law of thermodynamics? So whenever energy changes its forms, it is released in some way. So if I say apples were an energy, I took an apple and I converted it into an orange. Part of the energy that was in the apple is no longer in the orange. And usually this energy is released as heat. And so this is wasteful. Now, here's the thing. This energy, these emissions that are released, usually are greenhouse gases. Why is this bad? The greenhouse gas effect? Well, when greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide, like methane, are released into the air, it traps heat in the atmosphere. Why is this bad? Well, you guessed it. It contributes to global warming and climate change. And so... At the end of the day, why is it bad that we have so many carbon emissions? The answer would be because it traps heat in the atmosphere and that leads to climate change or global warming. This concept called cogeneration. Cogeneration is very efficient. It is essentially a process where you have one energy source or fuel to produce two forms of energy. So for example, you could produce high temperature heat and electricity, and you can use that heat for something else, and you can use the electricity to use as electricity. And so cogeneration is really efficient. Why is that? Because you have one source that's being used for to create two different energy forms. Now, let's go ahead and talk about the difference, as you probably know, uh, between non-renewable and renewable energy. What's the difference? Well, non-renewable energy as a fixed amount. At some point, we'll run out of it. Renewable energy, we will never run out of it. That's the great thing. Now, here's the problem. Many fossil fuels, in addition to having environmental impacts, they are non-renewable. And so what are some examples of non-renewable energy sources? Well, coal, oil, natural gas. Let's talk about coal, oil, and natural gas. So first, let's look at a coal power plant. As you can see here, there is first a place where coal is transferred into a furnace. This furnace, sometimes known as a combustion tank, essentially heats us up and creates steam out of the coal. And then that steam, as you can see, goes into the steam turbine and that steam moves the turbine, which then feeds the generator electricity and the generator can create electricity. That electricity is then moved off to power lines. Now, what happens to the steam? Well, the steam, the water vapor is then moved through the condenser where it condenses back to water, which it was before. And then it moves to a cooling tower, 
where we attempt to cool down the hot water. Remember, in the furnace, we heated this water up, and so it's hot right now. But in the cooling tower, it's supposed to cool down. Here's the thing, though. Cooling towers don't always fully do their job. Sometimes the water and the steam is still higher than the temperature originally was. This causes this thing called thermal pollution, where um, a pond or a lake could now have a hotter water temperature than it would have before. And that can actually cause problems with fish habitats and marine life and whatnot. And so this is what we call thermal pollution, heat pollution. Now let's look at an example of a nuclear power plant. If you look on the screen, you'll be able to see that in the middle, we have control rods and fuel rods. These essentially control the rate of fission and the power reactor. That circle you see right there, that is called the core. And the core of a nuclear power plant, as you probably already know, is very, very radioactive. And so that is what causes problems whenever these malfunction. Water flows in and then out of the core. And then the steam once again moves the turbine. This motion of the turbine powers a generator on and gives it electricity, which then can be used for power lines. Once again, we see that there is a condenser cooling tank right here. It's the exact same thing as before. Once the steam has powered the turbine, the steam sinks to the bottom and then it moves back into the cooling tank where it is cooled. And then once again, that water goes back to the core, gets heated into steam, and we have the cycle that repeats. Now, before we continue, I need to ask you a very important question. What is combustion? Combustion is the burning of fossil fuels. Another question, what are the side effects of combustion? What does it result in? Well, combustion creates CO2, which is carbon dioxide, H2O, which is water vapor, and heat. CO2 is produced, and that is once again how it creates air pollution. Lastly, let's talk about natural gas and fracking. So in order to get natural gas or some other fossil fuels, there's this process we undergo called fracking. Fracking is the process of injecting liquid at a high pressure into rocks, and that forces the um, oil out of the rock. Now, here's the thing. When we inject that high pressure, inject liquid, some of the chemicals are very toxic. And so if these chemicals, there's a spill of some sort, the chemicals go into the groundwater, there's groundwater pollution, the ocean can be polluted, oil spills cause dead zones in the water. There are all sorts of environmental um, hazards that fracking creates. Now let's move on to a happier tone that is renewable energy. So renewable energy, what are some examples? Well, there's solar, biomass, and geothermal energy. And there are a couple more. So let's start by looking at a diagram of a hydroelectric dam power plant. At the beginning, we see that there is a water reservoir of some sort, probably a river or a lake. And then the water flows in to this dam. And as it does that, its mechanical energy moves the turbine. And that turbine is then hooked up to a generator. And its mechanical energy, the moving of the turbine, is converted into electrical energy by the generator. That is then put into a, a transformer, and again, we get power. We can actually get energy from that. And so in here, we see a transfer from mechanical energy to electrical energy. We see a transfer from potential energy when the water is still to kinetic energy when the water is moving to mechanical energy when it moves the turbine, and then electrical energy when the generator turns mechanical energy into electrical energy. With the hydroelectric dam power plant, here's the thing. Sometimes fishes are not going to be able to get through to the other side of the river because there's a dam in between. And so we create these things called fish ladders where fishes will be able to go under the mechanism and fishes will be able to safely, hopefully, cross through the river. 
talk about run of the river hydroelectric power plants. So this happens with smaller rivers or lakes, while the hydroelectric dam is probably for large rivers and whatnot. And they could power small communities or things like that. So we start out with a river and there are two forks in the path that the water can travel through. The first is through this thing called we call a turbine house. And so we start with kinetic energy, the motion of the moving river, and it flows into the turbine house. And then that's turned into mechanical energy whenever the turbine is moved, which then with the generator is turned into electrical energy. Here's the great thing about hydroelectric dams and run of the river hydroelectric power plants. There is no air pollution or greenhouse gases. Now you need to know what active versus passive solar heating is. What is passive? Essentially passive solar heating is whenever there's heating and cooling. And then active is when we actually collect solar radiation and convert that heat into water or air. And so active involves some sort of probably collecting radiation and passive is simply heating and cooling naturally. Now let's talk about photovoltaic panels, also known as solar panels, also known as photovoltaic cells, also known as PV cells. So definitely know this. So silicon is the active element in most photovoltaic cells. And how do they work exactly? Here's the answer. So particles of light, so from the sun, they knock electrons free from the atoms and in that way generate electricity. Essentially, PV cells take the sunlight and generate that into electricity. A vocab word that's good to know here is on-grid versus off-grid solar panels. On-grid solar panels essentially use the light actively. They don't necessarily store the light themselves, but off-grid ones do. They can store solar powers in batteries whenever a power grid goes down. So if there's another winter storm here in Texas where everything shuts down, active or off-grid solar panels will save our day. Now let's talk about wind power. So wind power, very similar to what we've heard before, the wind moves the blades of a turbine and that turbine powers a generator which can be hooked up to a battery of some sort that collects electrical energy or it just directly supplies electricity to power lines and it is actually that simple it's much harder than it seems at first glance lastly let's cover geothermal energy so geothermal energy it uses steam steam rotates a turbine activates a generator and produces electricity. Are you seeing a pattern up here? I certainly am. Essentially, some sort of turbine is moved in some way in most cases, and that activates the generator, creates electricity, and then poof, we got power. Now, another type of renewable energy you might want to know is a hydrogen fuel cell. And a fuel cell has a couple of components. It has an electrolyte, a cathode, and an anode. And it is very expensive to manufacture, so there aren't, it's not in high use right now. But if it is used, it has a very high efficiency and can help eliminate fossil fuel pollution. If we had lots and lots of money to spare and we bought a bunch of hydrogen fuel cells, that would make our systems very, very efficient and would decrease our use of fossil fuels. Unfortunately, the limitation right now is that it costs a lot of money. Now, at the very end, the last stretch, the final stretch, I have one more concept I want to cover with y'all. And those are three different events. All you have to know is Chernobyl, Three Mile Island, and Thermal, and Fukushima. So if you know anything about any of these, you would know they all have something to do with a nuclear power plant. What happened? Well, at Chernobyl in Ukraine, a plant overheated, there was an explosion, there were fires, and unfortunately, many died. In Three Mile Island, located in Pennsylvania, a lack of cooling when cooling systems were unplugged led to partial core meltdown, which is not good given that the core, if you remember, is radioactive. Yeah. Um, and lastly, Fukushima, 
Why is it significant? What happened? Four out of six reactors were destroyed. That caused a lot of radiation. Again, um, many people had the potential to die. These are some very dangerous situations. Now, the last thing I want to mention is that in many nuclear power plants, there is a very common element used, and that element is called uranium-235, and it's used with fission, which can cause radiation and thermal pollution. All right, y'all, hope that was um, all right, y'all. Hope that was helpful. Please, please, please comment down below if this was helpful. Also, tell me, did you like this newer style of study video? Because in the past, we go by concept to concept to concept, like 5.1 to 5.2. Now we're like going all over the place, but hopefully in a structured way. I think it's just easier for us to retain information that way. Let me know if this was more helpful or less helpful than the previous uh, videos that we've had. Do you like this format better where it's less about like 5.1 to 5.2 or do you like the other format better? Comment down below what you think and also let me know if you do well on your test and if this was helpful because that motivates me to post the next video and so. Have a wonderful day. You can get back to your phone unless you have more homework. And bye, Ramya's out.